Hi everyone, my name is Alid Miles and I have the great pleasure of being the CEO here at Source Labs. It's my very great pleasure to introduce next our keynote speaker, Toby Eduardo Redshaw, the former Senior Vice President of 5G Innovation at Verizon. I've known Toby for a couple of years and the first time I heard him speak, I was very impressed. Not only is he fun and engaging and relevant, he's a futurist. He thinks about what's going to happen with technology and its effects on the world. And we thought it would be enormous fun to have him share those thoughts. And because he understands the world of test, it would be most valuable and relevant to kick off SourceCon. So sit back and enjoy. Toby Redshaw. One of the things we, we think about a lot at Source Labs is the concept of digital confidence. And it and it and for us, it means this relationship between a flawless user experience and that experience being trusted and secure. We also happen to believe that right now, software development rules the world. And I know that you agree with me, at least a part of that. Um, but of course, software has the, has the ability to change the world, but only if it works for everyone. And I was wondering, knowing the work that you do, for example, with Robert Swan, if you could change the world, what would you change? Well, we'd start with me being taller and better looking. That would be the uh, clearly the first thing. No, look, I, I, I think I, I am hugely optimistic about where the world is heading, right? I think the Gen Z focus on diversity and inclusion and social justice and a different way of viewing economics and a different way of viewing social corporate responsibility. I think those are going to be gravitational pulls that change things in a good way. And there'll be gravitational pulls because that cohort has such massive buying power um, that people will just, corporations will have to pay attention to that and institutions. So I'm, I'm optimistic about that. I'm optimistic about climate change. And if you've been paying attention in the last 10, 15 years, every year there's some scientific material science AI breakthrough that all of the smart people in that field thought was five years away, right? And that is a recurring, recurring theme. So I think that's also going to feed into um, uh, uh, feed into uh, goodness. And I think some of the current ugly polarization stuff is also positive. Typically, what happens after massive polarization is you have cathartic changing. Uh, events, or it gets really, really bad, one of the two. But I would try and accelerate us through this period of polarization a little faster. Yeah. Um, uh, I also think from a competitive thing in perspective, you know, anchoring this down on, on America just for a minute, you've got to get your whole team engaged. You've got to get your whole team on the playing field. What we do today, whereas we disenfranchise a segment of the population from an education, a healthcare, an opportunity perspective. If you're fighting a global battle, that's a stupid thing to do your own team. Um, and so for selfish competitive reasons, national interest, that is something that I wish we'd accelerate through uh, faster and think a little more clearly about. I read the other day, uh, I, think it's, I think it's from the art of war. And it's this concept of no one has ever achieved anything of note without having alliances. Uh, and I think it goes on to say something like, no, um, knowing how to conquer is the first step. Building alliances to get it done is the second step. And I kind of almost want to link what you were just talking about, very specifically relevant to the US, and also in a sense, your career, um, because you've been so responsible for that concept of alliance, both in your professional life and, of course, as you think about the world in general. How important has that been to you? Oh, look, hugely, hugely important. I was super lucky very early on to spend a little time with a couple of world-class network people, right, that knew. Uh, and I read a little tiny book by Andy Grove, who built Intel, when I was like 23. And it said, look, what you bring to the table is you plus your network. And oh, by the way, your network might actually be as valuable as you. So don't be, you know, egocentric about just what are you doing? Um, and to manage a network, what I was told very early is you just have to be useful, right? So that people will want you to be part of their 
you have to be engaging and useful and you have to bring something to the table. Uh, so I think on a, on a personal level, being able to build partnerships and be an authentic, uh, valuable, um, uh, never say no uh, thing. I, I don't ever say no immediately to anybody. I, I, the worst you'll get from me is, oh man, that, that sounds really, really hard. Let me go away and talk to some people and see if I can help figure it out. Worst case, I come back with, no, look, I've got no clue, but this guy, he can help you or she can help you. Or I come back and go, I've talked to my entire network. Nobody knows this. I think this might literally be impossible. I tried, I got nothing, right? But so at least you're doing, uh, doing that. And then more importantly, on a corporate uh, perspective, I think there are two sustainable competitive advantages in the next four or five years that get, uh, uh, that get no sort of press and are, are ignored. We reorganized the entire company uh, two years ago, next month. And one of the, the principal architectural thoughts behind it is being easy to partner with is tied to how we are structured and being easy to partner with in this future world where more and more competitors or partners, uh, customers or partners, that's really, really important. And being really skilled and good, and we've got a, you know, Verizon, we got a long way to go. Um, uh, being really skilled at partnering is, is truly, uh, uh, truly important. The other bit uh, that goes back to structure and approach and, and ties directly into source labs is, is the agility, the internal cycle time of your company could be a really sustainable competitive advantage. You're not always gonna have all the good ideas. You're gonna get leapfrogged. How you respond to that and how fast you are and how good you are in a service crisis or in an opportunity, uh, grabbing an opportunity matters about the internal agility of your company. How fast does that machine work? If you're a grandmaster in chess and I'm just some local yokel chess player and I get to move two times every time you move, I win. I mean, Sorry. I don't care how good you are at chess. I'll just win and I'll win. I'll win in about 40 moves. Um, so yeah, I, I think sustainable competitive advantages for the next few years, if you get some of the basics right, being able to partner properly uh, and well and being known for that and, and you know agility, the internal clock speed of your company. And lots of companies don't look at the things where agility dies. And one of them is that gap between we build stuff and we put it out in production, which is, oh, what do we call that? Oh yeah, testing. So. Well, look, perfectly said. I'm as, I mean, I'm astonished. The speed from almost whiteboard to keyboard to production uh, is moving at such pace. We, we see it every single day. You, you have been running uh, 5G innovation for Verizon for a number of years. So you've been at the heart of a very innovative moment in technology. Tell us a little bit about that and then give us maybe an arc to the future. So... So I've had this awesome, uh, uh, awesome five years at Verizon where I came in and, and led, here's what we mean when we say 5G, here's the 5G strategy, here's where the impact is going. And oh, by the way, that whole connectivity platform solutions, if that's really where we're going, we're gonna have to really get much better on AI and leverage the world-class bits that we've got and bring everybody up. We're gonna have to make sure that the boring, nobody wants to care about an API layer is state of the art. Then we're gonna to have to fix product uh, uh, development. And there's a couple of business units that need fixing some of our AI stuff, some of our location intelligence. Then we need to build out some 5G labs. And then we need to build out co-innovation labs with, with customers uh, and drive C-level relationships and understanding about this. So we've got to do all of that in this sort of innovative cascading way uh, uh, over five years. So super, um, super excited about that, especially the company of our scale, willing to strap on, you know, go first, be first um, uh, in those things. But now that stuff is all cooked and baked and industrialized and has process around it. And the, the mission, you know, if I owned Verizon, the mission now is leverage the dickens out of that stuff, build out the network, execute, execute, execute. And that's what the company's going to go do. So 
not really a Toby thing. Um, uh, and, and if I owned the company, I wouldn't pay me what they pay me to do to watch that stuff. And if I am me and I checked, I am, uh, I, I need to go do what what's next, right? Um, I've always done the sort of the what the what's next thing. Um, so tell us what that looks like to you. I mean, not even necessarily in perhaps personal terms, but as you look at the future, everybody loves to understand or try to what's coming. What are you worried about? What are you hopeful about? Future tech. So I look, I've been doing this stuff for this futurist build, innovate new stuff forever, right? I started as one of the first like 50 people on the international side of, uh, of FedEx when that sector didn't exist, right? The Nobody on earth thought there was such a thing as International Express because, well, you got customs and you're going into a dark hole and you're never going to, that's, that's just a non sequitur. So this is the time, the next three, four, five years, and really not not starting three years from now, starting, you know, like, I don't know, next month. Um, it's the biggest period of creative destruction that I'll have seen in my lifetime, probably in the last three uh, to four generations. And it's on the back of two orders of magnitude improvement in the efficacy, cost structure, speed of big data platforms, which most people have no idea that's going on in the background what that'll do to sensorization and IoT, the the giant upswing in, in XR from every angle you can look at, next gen cloud really maturing, right? Containers have only existed for what, five, six years. Uh, only 10% of enterprise data is in the cloud today. That's the shape of the beginning of something. And man, you put those developments in those four technologies on top of a super low latency, fat bandwidth, compute at the edge, 1,000x better density for IoT, 10x better for IoT, battery life network, which happens to be software defined and cloud native, holy cow, that really uh, makes, uh, makes a difference, which is going to accelerate the demand for really agile software development, end-to-end -end delivery processes. And maybe the only thing bigger than that is the ability to manage petabyte to exabyte scale data and push that out from you know analysis back at the core to real time analysis at the edge that changes everything now the, what people forget about periods of creative destruction is it's got the word destruction in it right and not everybody ends up on the creative um, uh, creative side i mean if you go back to turn of the century um, at the, the turn of the last century, 1900s, I think there were 200 car companies on earth, right? Um, nobody, nobody saw that coming. And a lot of it is you've got to adopt the technology and understand it, get the dirt on your fingernails and do all of that and the changes that are happening. But you've got to look at the model, not just I'm improving what I'm doing with the new tools and weapons, right? So that's a, an amazing time. And I want to be, you know, out in the, uh, um, uh, out in the heart of that. And so, so that's where I'm going. Yeah. Toby, what, what impact does that have? On, I suppose I, I left the question general, look at it. Let's look at it from both sides. The, 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 the audience here is people in software development, right? People yep. who are witnessing living, the the sh the shift of speed inside the CI/CD pipeline, just what impact to them, and then perhaps what impact to customers. So, if you're in the software world, I, I think you're going to see two really big things, right? For people that are already in going down the modern path, um, uh, you're going to see a race to accelerate, a race to automate a race to be more intelligent right to, yeah. to have that wonderful quality feedback loop it, if you are really good and agile around the testing area i guarantee you that has these two giant impacts right one is there's a feedback sort of almost existential loop back to development which makes development better and then there's a quality and an error defect elimination out in the real world, 
which to customers looks like, wow, those guys really nailed it. Well, no, they didn't really nail it. They just caught it, right? And because they've had this integrated smart process. The people at FedEx aren't smarter than everybody else. And the reason why they can sort 8 million packages a night uh, in Memphis through that one big hub and make four mistakes that they don't catch, it's the process and the layers of intelligence they've got, the testing that they've built into their process, which to customers looks like absolutely positively great service. And here's the cool thing, and going back to software development processes, that error detected, higher quality, lower defect thing is literally the low cost structure model too. So if you're out in the world and software matters as it does, and your process is more agile and has a better cost structure, dude, that's that's the game right there. So I so I think from a software perspective, that is sort of the answer to 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 that question. And there was a second part to your question that I'm completely blanking on now. Well, you, you did actually mention it with every credit to you. Um, and that is the impact, I suppose, for consumers, customers. Um, this 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 creative destruction that, that we're in, presumably, is it only good? Uh, depends who you are, right? Uh, so no one's happy at British Steel because uh, it doesn't exist anymore. But it was the foundation for empire, right? Mm. Um, and a lot of uh, colonial badness, but still, um, it, it was an engine. There was a new set of processes which were more efficient uh, uh, better cost structure that came out. And, and I think you see this in, in technology inside companies, which is why you're going to see a big uh, bifurcation. The British Steel folks said, man, I've, I've invested a shed load of money in my infrastructure. I can't go and rework this infrastructure just because somebody created this new CICD process, right? Now, steel industry was being built up in the Ruhr Valley because we destroyed it in the First World War, and people like Andrew Carnegie were building it from scratch. They went, oh, holy cow, I'll build it with the new stuff. So if my steel is 20% cheaper and 30% better quality, I can compete you to death, right? Um, where is British Steel today? It's gone. Uh, Henry Ford did the same thing with his model of construction for cars, right? Didn't have, didn't literally have better, prettier cars, just had a better, um, a better model. So you're going to see companies that are doing this smart, intelligent, end-to-end -end production line um, in software and others that are sort of so anchored into their current legacy. Uh, and it won't just be software, it'll be the entire uh, uh, AI big data stack too. Um, yeah. and, and you're going to see that 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 process of the, that happened to British Steel, right? You'll see some companies that just, just won't do it. And to answer the consumer question is, I'm going to start as, as a consumer to expect four things that are radically different over the next few years. One is a level of efficiency and engagement and quality in the software product. Two is a level of intelligence where products are proactive and predictive and pattern matched and preventative and, and process performant. Yes, that's a real word, you can look it up, at, versus non, right? Um, and then the third thing is I'm going to want to see whatever you're doing for me have my self-interest at heart, right? I don't need a bank. I need a financial institution that has my commercial best interests at heart, optimizes my commercial uh, uh, existence, stops me from doing stupid under leveraged things and helps me be better. And then after you do that, you can cross sell me and upsell me and store my money somewhere, right? Um, but I don't need a bank, I need that. So the third thing is, um, uh, is, is self-interest. Um, and then the fourth thing is, um, I really, really deeply dislike that Wayne Gretzky thing to, you know, skate to where the, the puck's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. That, now, that makes great sense if you're a professional hockey player. You want to skate to where uh, um, the puck's going to be. It also makes great sense if you're Wayne Gretzky and you have those skills, right? Um, I know all kinds of people who can think about a perfect golf game, couldn't do it if you put a gun to their heads, right? 
the the thing that's going to happen with the combination of these technologies and the point in time that we're at is companies are going to invent new places to go and the that's where the puck will be and they will take their customers there right i'm not going to try and guess where the puck is i've got enough intelligence enough engagement enough creativity I'm inventing new places and I'm taking my customers there with me. So the whole hockey metaphor just kind of falls off the, uh, um, uh, uh, off the table. It's sort of that in logic, it's the fallacy of affirming the consequent, right? Wayne Gretzky is great. Wayne Gretzky did this, that must be great. Yeah, not, not really how that works. Um, so yeah, I think it's those four things, which again, you, Think about your processes and your software being proactive and preventative and pattern matched and precise and process performant and predictive and, and, and permissioned and peer connected. And then think about your competitors that is the old waterfall-y kind of we knocked it together. It's kind of buggy. Which one of those do you want? I'm going back to the earlier comments. Which company do you want to be in? Because the company that got that right with those eight P's has better product better customer engagement, and a better cost structure, not a fair fight. That's where the destruction part of creative destruction is coming from. And, and it feels like that company has purpose. Yeah. And purpose, as we know, ends up being emotional, and emotional ends up being passionate. And when you combine, for me, that's the mixture of operational and adaptive leadership. Yep. That, that is thoughtful transformation. Um, look, uh, uh, that was a fascinating moment. I, I have to say, uh, I really locked in on that. Uh, um, amazing. Um, Toby, uh, I mean, look, you, you have also been, not that I wanna overdo the alliteration on P words, but you've been a practitioner. I mean, you have run a thousand software developers, probably more. Is there anything that you've learned that, that you know, here, here is a here is a is a group of individuals in the SDET world, the QA world, the Dev world. Things you've learned, advice you'd give. Yeah, so I I give this a little I give this a little thought because I've done you know I think my first big product development product engineering job was international customer automation in 1986. Right? Oh, wow, you did that. At, you did that. At, 12 years of age? Uh, you know, I was going to go with eight years, but yeah, you beat me to it. Um, so, um, and then, you know, I had a thousand uh, engineers in product development here at, uh, um, uh, at at Verizon. I had a bunch of new product introduction stuff at Amex and, and of course, startup-y stuff. And, and there are sort of three, um, three commonalities that just continue to, and, and I've seen this in other companies, and they're all really negative, right? So um, the engineering groups typically are stuck in, we're really good at this way we've done it, and we've really gotten great at doing this, and they've missed new things coming out um, uh, and just ignored it, right? The um, things you can do in some areas with low code, no code, or the early iRise stuff that would help you really design or people just in love with human factors and don't realize that HCI is 10 times better. Um, and so they get, they're, they're stuck in their own self-referential paradigm and they're not changing with the times or taking advantage and they're on the battlefield with muskets, right? And, and the other guys have got Gatling guns and you're just, I wish I had a better metaphor than that, but you get my you get my point. Um, the the other thing um, that I in more modern times that that I think folks miss is the information architecture information side of it, right? That no. oh man, if you'd only told me two years ago that you might be thinking about that, we could do it. But you know, the information architecture, you, we can't get there from here. You see it in construction, right? Well, I need a fifth story on the building. Oh. Well, you know, when we pour the foundation, it's just designed for a four story because that's you said you wanted a three story and we figured maybe it'll go to four. Man, now we have to tear down the whole building. But that metaphorically um, uh, happening in, uh, um, uh, in, in that space. And then they generally all completely suck at program management. 
right? Which is, and, and they do this thing that I call micro sense and macro nonsense that, yeah, you know, in, in during the testing phase, we found these things and we're really gonna have to go rethink that. And it's, so we're gonna miss that deadline by three months. And you go, well, yeah, that's a, you found a real thing. You couldn't have anticipated that, or maybe you could, but probably not. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Or this bit just was harder than we thought, or um, here's one that happens all the time. You know, I've got this other design idea and it's a really, really good one. Let's go back to design. Let's pause, build that and go back and do, yeah, that's, you know, and even in a CICD world, you see that sort of stuff happening. Makes micro sense. At a macro level, this happens all the time. How can it be permissible? How can you run your shop like that? Can't you think through ways to manage it? And there are a couple of clever ways to manage that sort of stuff. It's about being serious about change management, serious about program management. It's like understanding those things and knowing how to reschedule them and kind of parse them in the right way. I mean, I I had one team, uh, I said, okay, show me how you program manage this. Show me a PERT chart. And uh, I got a PowerPoint of a Gantt chart and I went, oh, this this is going to be bad, right? Um, But then, but, but the improvement cycle is so fun and wonderful if you don't torture people for previous bad behavior and move them safely uh, to new uh, to new paradigms. But I think there's a huge, uh, a huge opportunity with that. I'm just last week, I looked at this thing that I thought um, was going to be uh, just, as the British say, rubbish. It, it was an AI platform that does natural language processing around interactions between product leads and cognoscenti who know things to um, sort of double blind and analyze the input and give you the real intelligence without uh, without bias and from a larger group than you would normally talk to, whether it's customers or experts uh, or people trying to make portfolio decisions in, 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 in venture companies. And it really worked. And so I think you're going to see from a design perspective you're going to see decision augmented decision support layers start to come on top of those uh, i'm getting a tiny bit off the subject but I, th- I think this stuff is evolving fast and again back to your your solution factory your software development process keeping up with how these things change uh, uh and being and, and being good i mean muskets were the weapon for a long long time until they weren't right right um, you've been kind of to mention the word test a few times, and obviously that's what we do. The path that we're on is to is to create a test platform, an, a, a, a collaborative test platform enabled by data that enables signals to be connected. So you talk about you know the concept of an error message getting into the hands of those who can correct or recode as quickly as possible so that you continue the level of quality and the speed to production. T- test, you know, we see is, is pervasive. It's everywhere. It's in production. Personas are changing. Um, the automation bar needs to be lowered. The citizen developer um, is here. And, and in a sense, ironically, for a company who does test, it's our job to help companies test less. Yep. Do you do you feel, I suppose, the the pathway that we've been talking about makes sense? Uh, uh, would you give us advice or future thoughts about where we're taking our business and trying to, uh, as you said earlier on, you know, avoid the skate where the puck is going, but take customers to a place that's the right place. Yeah, I, I'm. And I'll caveat this with, um, you know, I've had a couple of marketing jobs and I've never been really good at it. Um, but, but I think there needs to be a new story, right? The way I've looked at uh, a test, and this is partly growing up at, at FedEx and, and how advanced they were on, uh, on things. Oh, FedEx, for many, many years, 
basically ran like this. Call centers captured tons and tons of codified complaints from customers, stack ranked them. I mean, literally, what what is your problem? It's one of these 10. And within these 10, what have you got? Okay, it's that one. So now I've got a matrix of 100 things and I stack rank those. And then I go torture the dickens out of operations to go, look what you're doing to my customers. And they are incented because it's FedEx to do something about that. And so you're on this continuous, awesome uh, improvement cycle, right? Which improves quality and improves uh, the quality of the customer sees, improves engagement, saleability of the product, but also lowers your cost structure at the same time, right? And if I've got a better engagement model and value proposition to customers, and I've got a lower cost structure, I don't care what business you're in, you, you win, right? So I think there's a reframing in the modern world of what testing is, right? I'd almost not want to call it testing. I said, look, this platform is going to put you on a continuous improvement path and it's going to increase your agility and your customers are going to see this as a quality improvement, less defects. So how do you do that and how do you become continually more agile and how do you not fall behind well, this is, this is, you know, a system, a nitrous system we're dropping on your engine. It's the uh, next level to this process that you must go now and fix. And honestly, most companies still super suck at this, right? So it is new news and an upside. I know, by the way, it does that thing that you thought was testing, but here's what this ecosystem is. And I, I think that is a very valuable story. I, back in the olden days, uh, 18 years ago, we had at, at, um, at Motorola, we had 1,300 test people with the testing job scattered all over the place and very, very varying uh, levels of quality. So average, poor quality, really high cost structure. We pulled them all together into one group of 325 people, right? So we almost reduced it by a factor of four. We were the showcase for the Mercury platform, which was the automated platform way back then, sort of the, the grandfather of the clever stuff you guys do. And quality went up and cost went down by a factor of four and it was fantastic, right? And speed out the door went up. Uh, so I know that works. And then, then you know, not to pick on HP, they bought the product and ruined it. Uh, back when HP software was a, not a big deal for them. So I understand, uh, I understand why. And I just... And I just remembered some friends of mine used to run that. So I'm probably going to get in trouble. I, but, I don't think anyone from HP is with us. Okay. Yeah, I, no, okay. yeah, no, they're not still there, but I know where, I know where they work, but um, a guy called Tom, uh, but. Um, oh, Tom HP. Yeah, Tom. Yeah. And yeah. You did, you're not built on Tom. So anyway, a good golfer. So right. um, uh, yeah, so I, 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 I believe this stuff intellectually. I believe it from a supply chain get to market perspective, but I believe it because I've done it, right? Yeah. And I and I think uh, historically at some companies, there's still two, there's two giant technology gaps for the modern world that if you grab the CIO or one of the business people or a senior person, I go, hey, who who's in charge of testing at your company? They go, ah, yeah, it's somebody we were mad at. We put them in the basement. I forget their name. Same thing with information architecture, right? And those two things, especially if you rephrase testing as, okay, who's in charge of end-to-end -end agility and that quality feedback loop that puts you on a continuous superior competitive path? Who's got that? And they go, I didn't even know that was a thing, right? And go, yeah, well, we used to call that testing. So it's a storytelling thing, I think, is, is, is at the cause, but it's one of those beautiful stories that, you know, has real material output. I, I love innovation. I love pragmatism more. Innovation is really two Latin words. It means make new stuff, right? And I'm making new stuff that nobody cares about, a bit of a problem. So as we come towards the end i have two things left in my head here one is 5g was pretty transformational um 6g, 6G is, is likely to be upon us quicker than we think what impact will that have as you sit 
having gone through the 5G revolution? So, so I honestly would not spend any time thinking or worrying about 6G at all. Um, because of the nature of the te telecom industry, because it is so capital intensive, it really does need, and because the nature of it, right? You, the moment it stops being interoperable, just it's not. So they sort of have to collaborate and do a common spec, right? Um, some of that may change because it's all turning into software. Um, if only there was a company that tested software well, that'd be a good idea. Yeah. Um, but it it takes years for all of those, the hundreds of people assigned to this to break it into pieces and start doing things. And they essentially do three things, right? What did we screw up in the last spec that we should fix? Um, what technologies have changed and where are they going? How do we design uh, uh, for that? And then what other internal industry things do we, frictions do we see that we have to fix? And that, they go off and they do that, right? I, I, you're not going to see that for a decade. I think you're going to see a ton of 5G stuff start to roll out and really become material 22, 23. And again, it's going to be the platforms and the solutions on top of what is a software defined cloud native network. You're going to see massive changes in pervasive AI at the edge. Uh, XR, um, cognitive video, sensorization, synthetic IoT uh, um, uh, come out of those. And it's going to change every, um, every sector, especially the ones that have massive inherent inefficiencies like manufacturing, healthcare, education, uh, distribution. Um, yeah, uh, entertainment venues, just, just those uh, to start with. But yeah, I... I don't spend any time worrying about 6G. I, I, I really think um, that's going to take a long time just because the process itself takes a long time. Right. And I think people are going to be leveraging new technologies into 5G for five or six more years. Interesting. I, I'm very clear. The creative disruption uh, just to play off that word destruction. When you were growing up, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you're born in Mexico. Born and raised, Toby Eduardo. That's my real name. I, 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 give us a flavor of that. And as you viewed the world from your childhood, and now looking back, ever thought you'd be in this part of your career in technology at this time? In a, no, and I, I actually, my parents moved to America and I stayed in Mexico and moved in with a friend of mine because I went, I'm not going to America. I'm staying here in this. And plus, it was Tennessee, which I love Tennessee. A lot of nice things about Tennessee. But I was in a 25 million person metroplex, right? And I'm like, and I had this thing wired. I knew how to skateboard all the way from one side, jump on the sub subway, go through traffic, get there. Plus, think about this, right? I grew up in a country that had big elections and lots of fanfare and giant campaigns. And on the ballot, you had one party and one candidate for every job, right? So I have a very delightful view of American democracy in the US Constitution, because I spent, there was a country that for 70 plus years, you had one party and one choice. And to make it even crazier, giant election campaigns, right? Uh, I also grew up in a country that thought rock music was bad for you. Uh, and so when I was in high school, people up here were listening to Boston and Journey. I was doing the twist and the hop because that's the last music that came in. So when I came to America in 1979, I was really good at the dances the mothers of my dates liked, which was like, wait, what, what, what's that other weird stuff? Um, well, that, can, indeer, that can endear you to the family you want to be endeared to. And there's some positive in there. Plus, plus, if you can actually dance the hop, it's actually pretty cool. Or it was, it was in, the, uh, in my punky days in the 80s. So um, uh, 70s and eight, late 70s uh, and 80s. Plus, um, the, the, the culture is just so different, right? Extended family and how you, how you think. I'm still, I'm still an absolute world-class pro at taking naps, right? It's part of my national heritage. Yeah. Um, 
but I'm I'm completely comfortable um, uh, in, in this culture. And, and I um, I was on my way to being a philosophy uh, yeah. a, a philosophy professor. A pivotal moment in my life. I got offered a a really great scholarship to go to Oxford at the same time, and very quickly go to master's PhD. Um, and I already had a couple of degrees, and uh, and I got offered this job at FedEx, which was we're gonna we're doing this international M&A thing and we need somebody to help integrate these companies and set up call centers in Hamburg, Frankfurt, Paris, London, Honolulu, um, Singapore, Tokyo, I'm missing one, uh, and one other cool, great, super cool city. So um, uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, because of course that's international. Um, and, and I'm like a 21 year old kid on an expense I, report going I'm me up. Oxford professor going big on Edmund Husserl and phenomenology or that. And I went sold, never look back. So yeah. Yeah. Very and, happy. Uh, very happy to come to America. Met my awesome American wife here who is, uh, uh, who has suffered with me for a long, long time. We're still together, which is good. So nice work. Well done. I mean, in the midst of all of that travel, right, other than Mexico, favorite country? You know, I'm, I'm a, I, was, I was a weird kid and I'm a weird adult. I really don't do a lot of favorites, right? I, um, uh, I, I, and I learned some of this from my little brother, but where you're at, just make that the best place, right? When, we were, kids, when we were kids with fake IDs going into bars in, in America when we were both in uni, um, he would walk in and just go, oh, man, that that cheeseburger smell sounds fantastic. Oh, that's my favorite jukebox for that's how old we are. Right. Jukebox. Oh, they got my best favorite beer. This has got to be the best place to be right up until we went to the next place. And then he'd say the same thing about the next place. Right. And so I I, I find wonderful things in everything, especially new places that I go to. When I started going to Malaysia. The supermarket was fun, right? I, yeah. I just go in the supermarket. I'm gonna buy something. I don't know yeah. what it is, uh, but I do love I do love big cosmo cities. I love London. I love Paris. Yeah. Uh, I love uh, Tokyo. I love New York. Um, but I don't know. I don't have I don't have favorites. I there are a couple of countries I've been to a lot that like if I never go back, I'm okay with that. But I'm not gonna say those because it'll hurt people's feelings. And one of those is not Wales, right? No, I, and no, I need to spend more time in Wales. I need some of that salt marsh lamb that they have over there. Yeah, we need, yeah. I think we might need you to spend some time in Wales. Sure. Uh, that, this is a country of of extraordinary new innovation. Wales, incredible. Was my right hand, Keith Misson, this wonderfully smart, turned on uh, my head of innovation when I was at. Uh, 314 year old Aviva in London run by a Lord. Literally our chairman was this awesome dude, Lord Charman of Red Lynch. Literally, I didn't make that up. That's not from Downton Abbey. You can't make that up. Uh, um, and I had this Welsh, uh, this young man from Wales. He was, he was just awesome. So, you know, based on that sampling of one and you, I mean, why not, right? Listen, we're very, very uh, fortunate that you gave us a, big chunk of your time and also your mind. Um, thank you for being such an innovative leader in your own right. And I know uh, a lot of the work that you do beyond uh, Verizon and onwards uh, is good work too. Thank you for being a great human um, no, and a good pal of Source Labs. Uh, Toby, we wish you every ongoing success and, um, and thank you for spending time with us here at SourceCon 2021. That's very kind. Thanks. Uh, enjoyed it. Um, happy to help.